We're going to continue celebrating. I'm going to uh, probably forever keep eyes on candles now. Um, but we've been celebrating the season of Advent. Uh, we're going to continue that. We started out the season of Advent a couple weeks ago with the reminder that the Christmas season is a season for worship. It is a season for worship. As we prepare, as we uh, anticipate the day where we celebrate the arrival of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then last week we looked at the topic of joy. And we saw that the joy that Jesus gives us cannot be taken away because the joy Jesus gives us is rooted in our salvation. And so this week as we progress, we're going to look at the topic of peace this morning. Now, the gifts of love and joy and peace and hope that are given to us through a relationship with God are all connected. They're all connected, but uh, if I was to be authentic here this morning, I'd have to admit that peace is one that I, out of the others, personally struggle with the most. Uh, So if you don't mind me, I'll be preaching to myself a little bit this morning as well. Uh, I don't know about you, but I desire to have peace in my life. I have a desire to have the peace that passes understanding. I don't want to be stressed out and and all that. Does anyone want to be stressed out? No. We want that peace that only God can give. So we're going to look at some scriptures today, and I pray that the Lord speaks to your heart. So um, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and When you find those, if you would stand for the reading of the word, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, if you are able and willing, please stand. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us into your house. Once again, it is a privilege. It is not a burden to be into your house, praising and worshiping your name. It is such a gift, such a blessing. And so, Father, as I preach this morning, I pray that your word would go out and it would go out with a purpose and that someone would be helped this morning, that someone would be able to find some peace this morning, that someone would be strengthened in their faith. Father, I ask that I would decrease and that only you would be seen, and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So in 1996, an organization by the name of Pro Peace organized a peace march in response to the nuclear arms race that, the, that had been occurring in the world. The March for Peace was led by a, name, a man by the name of David Mixner, who was also the leader or the CEO of Pro Peace Organization. This group was extremely passionate about the disarming of disarming the world of nuclear weapons. So they decided to organize a march from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., in order to gain attention for their cause of achieving world peace. They opened up a campaign for like-minded individuals who desired world peace, and they came up with a plan. uh, They came up with a plan they believed would have great results in a world full of war. On February 28, 1986, they held a kickoff concert and rally just to get everyone pumped up and motivated for the March for Peace. And then the next day, March 1st, 1986, uh, about 1,200 peace marchers started their peace journey to the East Coast. It was a great day of excitement, and everyone was pumped up. Unfortunately, and even though they had the best intentions, and even though this group was extremely motivated, the 1,200 peace marchers only made it about 120 miles outside of Los Angeles. They made it to the desert city of Barstow, where the march mostly self-destructed. You see this organization called Pro Peace, who was intent on creating world peace, could not even keep the peace within their own group. What happened is they started bickering and they started fighting amongst themselves. They started arguing about who were the real peace marchers, because some of them said, ah, we're not walking, we're going to drive. They fought over dress code, and they fought over what colors they should all be united in wearing along the way. And then they decided that the best way to keep peace is to have a democracy. 
So they, they, they held an election about all the rules and who should be the leader, but they ended up fighting about who could vote and who couldn't vote and what the right age of voting should be. They ran out of resources such as food and water and money as selfish ambition and corruption set in. And no matter how excited they were, two weeks prior, the march self-destructed and over half of the 1,200 peace marchers quit and went home. According to the Orange County Register, many ended the peace march vowing never to speak to each other again. Oh, peace was lost. Even in their best humanly attempt to make peace. Family, I need you to understand this morning that that peace march is a microcosm of the entire history of humanity. For since the beginning of creation, Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve rebelled against God, peace has been lost. Despite man's greatest attempts, peace could not and cannot be recovered outside of God's intervention. Original sin created intense alienation between God and man and between man and man. For early on in the history of mankind, brothers began hating even their own brothers, as we see with the first family where Cain killed his brother Abel. Family peace has been lost. Through biblical history, we see a line of division and hate occur occur generation after generation. Even in God's chosen nation, the nation of Israel, peace was still not recovered. Biblical history is a history of war because peace has been lost. The peace between God and his crowning creation of mankind has been lost. Racism and discrimination and hate and strife and division and anger all resulting from sin, the fall of mankind, has become normal. The hate between Jew and Gentile was about as vicious as it could possibly be because peace was lost. Fast forward to 2022, and we can clearly see that peace has not been recovered as of yet. For the majority of people, real peace has never been found. The murder rate is as high as it could be. The uh, uh, divorce rate is as high as it's ever been. Our country is divided like it's never been before. Family peace has been lost. As, as dark as all these truths are, I didn't come up here to discourage you. I've come for your joy, and I've come to tell you this morning that even though peace had been lost, God has a plan. For God didn't just come up with a plan B once Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. No, even before the eternal Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, let us make man in our uh, our own image, God had a plan to bring peace to mankind. You see, the fact that God has a plan to bring peace is good news this morning, because if God has and if God had an eternal cosmic plan to right every wrong and bring peace to a violent world constantly at war, then God must also have a plan to make peace for us and in us and all around you. Found that I don't know if anyone can relate, but there's been seasons There's been weeks, there's been months, and there's even been years in my life that have been so chaotic where I've yearned for even a small amount of peace. There's been times where uh, absolutely everything feels like it's falling apart around me and peace doesn't even seem to be a possibility. Yet the truth of the matter is despite what our emotions tell us, God is still in control and God still has a plan. It may not feel like it at the moment, but God has a plan to bring you peace. Oh yeah, you, you got to believe and have faith this morning that we have a God that has a plan and a desire to bring peace into your life. You got to believe that we have a good and we have a perfect heavenly father in heaven that delights to give good gifts to his children. And there is no better gift than the gift of peace. For the biblical definition of peace reaches uh, beyond the moment of silence where you finally get the kids in bed for the night. It reaches beyond a, a, a silent night. The biblical definition of peace reaches beyond that, and the biblical definition of peace is a completeness, a wholeness, a prosperity of the spirit and of the soul that rises up in you despite the war raging all around you. And I don't know about you, but I desire that peace, don't you? I desire that peace. And I'm thankful that God had a plan 
to bring peace into the world. So now the question is, what was and what is God's plan to bring peace into the world? Well, that brings me to point number one this morning. Very simply, that uh, God's plan for peace is Jesus Christ. That God's plan for peace is Jesus. God's plan for peace is Jesus. God's plan for peace is not a cleverly designed peace march. God's plan for peace is not deep breathing techniques as, 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 as helpful as those might be at times. God's plan is not some form of yoga where you attempt to clear your mind and think about peace. No, God's plan for peace was and is and always will be none other than Jesus Christ. God's plan was to send Jesus into a world full of war and conflict in order to bring peace out of chaos. For Galatians chapter 4 says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth what? God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, God had a plan, and it took the fullness of time for that plan to be realized. And Isaiah prophesied 700 years prior that for us, a child would be born. To us, a son would be given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see, God's plan was to send Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to declare and to offer peace to all the nations of the world. Family, I believe in the days of head, one of our greatest evangelistic advantages a Christian uh, who firmly believes in Jesus will have is that we have operate in peace in a chaotic world. If we want to be a church, if we want to be individuals that are going to be used by God to bring salvation to other people and share the gospel to a dying world, it would be our advantage to operate in peace. So I want to jump this morning to a very very famous scripture that the Apostle Paul wrote. I I want to look at this scripture, even though I looked at it a couple months ago. I I ask you to turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We want to look at this uh, famous scripture. Scripture. Philippians 4 says this, 4 through 7 says, Rejoice and rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And then he says this He says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in. Christ Jesus. Family, what's always been fascinating about these scriptures is that after meeting the Prince of Peace on the road to Damascus, Paul's life on the outside seemed to be anything but peaceful. Yet he was able to sit in a jail cell and write this letter and write these words. Paul often gave us a glimpse of his trials and tribulations, yet he lived with an abundant amount of peace. Paul went through all these trials and tribulations, yet he was able to say, uh, you can, we can have the peace that passes all understanding. And as I consider what Paul knew that we need to know, it brings me to my next point is that, yes, point number one, Jesus is God's plan for peace. But point number two, the peace of God is first and foremost peace with God. The peace of God is first and foremost peace with God with God. Paul says in verse 4, he says, rejoice and rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say rejoice. You see, family, what Paul realized is that uh, when he received a revelation from God, he realized that he was living a life of sin, that no matter how religious he was and no matter how zealous he was, he was living a life of sin and rebellion. Paul admitted that he was the chief of sinners and that all his fleshly accomplishments and all his supposed back bragging rights were all trash. Paul teaches us that before we were born again believers through faith in Christ, that we were all alienated from God and totally incapable of pleasing God. Paul's teaching throughout the New Testament shows us that before coming to Christ, even if you think you weren't all that bad, the truth of the matter is we were all in total rebellion against God, that our sinful nature was passed down from Adam and has totally corrupted us, leaving us spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. And Paul understood that prior to meeting Jesus on the Damascus Road, while he was on the way 
to murder God's children, that he didn't just fall a little bit short of pleasing God, that he fall, he fell way short of pleasing God. And in fact, he wasn't a friend of God at all. In fact, that he was an enemy to God. For Romans 5 says, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Family, to live a life full of hope and love, a life full of peace and joy and love, we have to understand the depths of the sin nature and the miracle of what God has brought us out of. Has God brought you out of anything in your life? Are you still the same as you were 20 years ago? As, uh, do you still think the same as you did five years ago? God has brought us out of so much. He has brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And you see, the people that are most on fire for Jesus are usually the people who understand the depths of their sin and how they and how we have been forgiven so much that now we turn around and continually fall at the feet of Jesus in worship for all he's done in our life. And so, as a reminder this morning, we need to continually take ourselves back to the miracle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as followers, as Christ followers, we can never allow the gospel to become old news to us. As I said to you last week, sometimes we stand in front of the Niagara Falls and we don't care about it at all. Uh, sometimes we uh, don't even realize that we have this great salvation and we become uninterested in it. And then we wonder why we don't have peace and we don't have joy in our life. We can get in a little bit of a funk sometimes, can't we? And we uh, can be tempted about uh, to wonder, what do I have to rejoice about? Paul says, rejoice and rejoice always. But we say, well, what do I have to rejoice about? Well, you could rejoice in your salvation. Once in a while, there's a, a song that we sing that says that there is power in the name of Jesus. And I do love this song. And it says that uh, uh, through Jesus, every chain has been broken. And, and, and that's all good. Uh, and we ask and we plead for the Lord to break every chain in our life. But I need to tell you this morning, if you're a believer in Christ, Jesus, every chain has already been broken over your life. Because if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, the, the, the bondage of sin has been broken in your life. Yeah, yeah, I know that you would like some more money, and, and I know that you would like your kids to behave a little better, and, and I know you would like a new job, and I know you would like things to just be better overall, but that's not the bondage that's keeping you down. You know what the bondage that was keeping you down was? The bondage that was keeping you down was sin, and that has been broken in your life. That's good news this morning, isn't it? For we weren't sinking deep in sin. No, we were sunk in sin. We were the ones that needed to be reconciled to God. Even if you think you weren't that bad or you weren't as bad as somebody else, the truth is the matter. We were all hostile and rebellious against the very God that created us. Ah, but God, but God, but, but God did something. But God, who is rich in mercy and, and grace, and because of the great love that he had loved us with, even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ, and it's by grace and only by grace that you and I are saved. So now we can rejoice for the love of God for God had a plan. The plan is Jesus Christ. The plan is Jesus Christ. And he's accomplished his uh, plan of peace by sending his only son to die on the cross for our sins. If we would just simply repent and place our faith in him. For Ephesians 2.13 says that. But, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, for he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. And what did he do? He has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Family, there is no reason not to live in peace with other people. For God has broken down the wall through Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, real peace is first and foremost peace with God because Jesus has made it all possible. These scriptures tell us that Jesus is our peace, that Jesus makes our peace, that Jesus purchased our peace, and that Jesus 
preaches our peace. It doesn't matter if you were far off, or it doesn't matter if you were near. It doesn't matter if you were a cocaine-smoking alcoholic, or if you were the most religious zealot in the entire community. You must come through Jesus Christ by faith to get peace with God in your life. So how can we rejoice and how can we rejoice always again and again? We can rejoice because we've been saved. We we have a secure future. We have a relationship with the almighty God. We have the faithful promises of God that never fail. Family, God's plan for peace is Jesus. God's plan for peace is Jesus. The peace of God is foremost peace with God. And then number three, I might step on some toes this morning, that's all right. But if you want to live in peace and with peace, you must live in peace with people. You must live in peace with people. Verse 5, I preached this four or five months ago, and I'm going to do it again uh, because the word is still good, right? Verse 5 says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So what does that tell me? That tells me that we have a vertical peace with God, but now we must have a horizontal peace with people. He says this, Paul says this, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. He doesn't say, let your reasonableness be known to only those people that you like. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Reasonableness, what does that mean? Well, reasonableness, uh, um, in some translations, it says gentleness or moderation. But the definition of the, in the original language of reasonableness means to have a good disposition towards other people, to patiently bear with other people, to be gracious towards others, to be full of generosity and good will with gracious humility. This is what must be known to everyone in your life if you want to have peace, our reasonableness. But even deeper than reasonableness, I believe that people that have the most peace in their life are people who love other people the most. Quite frankly, maybe this is just me, but to me, it's just too exhausting to have a list of people that I don't want to talk to. It's just too exhausting to me to uh, uh, dislike people. It's just too exhausting to live in conflict with people. It's just too exhausting to worry about what everyone else is doing and be so full of a a criticism towards other people. Ah, That's not living a life of peace, is it? It's just too exhausting. Family, if you want to have peace with uh, inside yourself and all around, you must live in peace with people. You must be reasonable. You must be full of love for other people. Uh, the kingdom of God is built through love, not through criticism, not through war with other people. Because here's the thing, a, a true church, a true uh, functioning, grace-filled church, a, a Christian community is the most powerful group of people in this entire world when we are operating according to God's word. So as a church family, we must be reasonable. We must be full of love for people. We must be uh, full of love for a community uh, that, that is dying all around us. We must be full of love. We should be so uh, humble and so full of humility, so full of love and hope and, and peace that whatever threatens to uh, come between you and another person be squashed and squashed immediately. There should be an ongoing and ongoing attitude of repentance and ongoing attitude of forgiveness and ongoing attitude of compassion, not, not insisting on having your own way, uh, uh, looking out for the interests of other people. There should be an ongoing attitude of grace and mercy since God has flooded you with so much grace and mercy. Hasn't he? You should turn around and extend that to other people. Our job is to live in peace with people. If we want peace with ourselves and within our life, do you want to live in peace? You must believe that God's plan for peace is Jesus. That peace of God is first and foremost the peace with God. And if you want to live a life of peace, you must live in peace with people. Maybe asking, okay, Clint, uh, uh, that's good, but how do I deal with all the stress around me? How do I deal? I, I love God, and I love people, and to my knowledge, I am not uh, uh, at war with other people. How, but things keep happening in my life. 
practical things. Things in my house keep breaking down. My kids keep uh, getting on my nerves. Uh, you know, I notice uh, say kids more often now that I have a kid that gets on my nerves a little bit sometimes, as cute as he is. But how do we get peace? How do we get this daily moment-to-moment peace in our life? Well, number four, I've said this before. This is no surprise. This is no secret. This is not new news. This is old news that still works. If you want peace in your life, you have to understand that there is a connection between peace and trusting God in prayer. The Bible gives us a promise in verse 6 where it says, Do not be anxious about anything but in everything. What should we do uh, in everything? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Family, these are one of the most memorized and most popular verses in the entire Bible. These scriptures are are, are so popular that if you go into the Bible bookstore, you will find a cup with this scripture on it. And you will be able to wake up in the morning and have your coffee and and everything's all gentle and calm. And then you could take a picture and say, oh, look at my morning devotion. Everything's perfect in my life. And then when the camera uh, gets turned off, everything is crazy in your life. I know how that works. But here's the thing. The purpose of God word is not to have a cute little coffee mug or not to have a nice Instagram picture or not to show everyone how spiritual you are on Facebook. Uh, uh, No, the purpose of God is to be learned and then obeyed and then lived out in your life. And these scriptures are So important to live out in your life if you want to have peace. The Bible says, be anxious about nothing. There's nothing too small or too big to take to God. He says, don't be anxious, but uh, uh, don't worry about it, but pray about it. And so there's something about being in the presence of God where worries will cease. You see, you must get into the presence of God by worshiping him and praying him. Yes, you can come with your laundry list. I'm not one of those pastors that say, well, you should just worship and you should just tell him how good he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I got some things I need worked out. Is anyone with me? I mean, uh, I would be the biggest hypocrite in the world if I said, put your laundry list away. No, I got a laundry list too. But yes, we should start uh, getting into the presence of God with worship and with adoration and telling him how great he is and, and, and worshiping in holy name and saying, Father in heaven, oh, hallowed be your name. But then don't put your laundry list away. You can come to him with it. He says, uh, uh, pray about everything. So if we're going to have peace in our life, we have to pray about everything. I love what Hebrews 4 says. Hebrews 4 says, let us then with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. He says, let us with confidence. We don't have to come into the presence of God like a scared little child. No, we have a father in heaven who controls everything at all times. We can come with confidence. We can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. Oh, isn't that good news this morning? that we can find mercy and grace in the presence of God to help us in our time of need. Family, there is peace in the presence of God. There is hope in the presence of God. There is overflowing love in the presence of God. There is joy in the presence of God. There is strength in the presence of God. In the presence of God, the Holy Spirit does something inside your weary soul that is called restoration. In the presence of God, your burdens can be lifted. Family. Would you pray? Would you pray? Would you get into the presence of God? Because here's the promise. The promise is that the peace of God, which suppresses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. That is a promise of God, that if you would pray that the peace of God that suppresses all understanding, that means you don't have to try to understand it. 
Sometimes we get the peace of God, and then what do we do? We ask ourselves, well, I don't know why I have the peace of God. Uh, Everything is going crazy around me. I shouldn't have the peace of God. Let me go do something, and then what happens? We fall out of peace. No, the scripture said the peace of God that suppresses all your understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That phrase, will guard, means that God will literally put a, uh, put a fence around your heart and your mind and guard the enemy that wants to get into your minds. That's good news this morning. Why do we forfeit it? Why do we forfeit it? And then he says the peace of God, the peace of God, the God of peace, the peace of God, the peace of God, the, that God will do it. God who gives you peace. God who gives you peace. Notice the word doesn't say that God, that God will immediately change your circumstances. No, he says, I will give you peace in despite, despite your circumstances. So would you meet the condition to receive the promise? Family, would you pray and receive this, this supernatural peace? I think the reason prayer is so hard for us is that prayer Trusting God in prayer is so hard for us because prayer is denying ourselves. That prayer is denying ourselves and our need, our tendency to want to control everything. That prayer is trusting God and his plan because he's already sent his son to be your prince of peace. He's already sent his son to the cross to die. He's already raised Jesus from the dead. He's already exalted Jesus to a place of power at the right hand in in heaven. But the shame is we don't operate in this promise every day and every second of our life. We don't meet the condition to receive the promise of peace because we don't pray. And when our life is in turmoil and when we need peace, sometimes we do what the pro-priest life organization did. And we organize marches and we organize campaigns and we just try to figure it all out that if I do this and if I do that and if, if, if this person leaves me alone and, and, and if I just eliminate everything that is, is stopping me from having peace, then I'll have peace. We try to figure it out on our own instead of going to God in prayer. But I must tell you, as cute as Facebook posts are, if you try to eliminate everything in your life that that disrupts your peace, guess what? You're going to be mighty tired. Because we are never going to have total peace until we get to heaven. So you can eliminate people and still not have peace. You can quit your job and move to the Bahamas, and you will still not have peace outside of God. Would you go to God in prayer? Family, God has a plan for peace. His name is Jesus. The peace of God is foremost. The peace with God. There, uh, uh, we must live in peace with people if we want to have peace in our life. There is a connection between peace and trusting God in prayer. And then in conclusion this morning, I know this is Christmas, and, and I know that maybe I'm supposed to bring a soft and cuddly message for you this morning, but If I'm being authentic here this morning, um, I haven't had a soft and cuddly week. I haven't had a a soft and cuddly few weeks. And quite frankly, I've been in battle mode and, and I haven't done it perfectly at all. But I believe in preparation for this message, I was going a whole different way. And then yesterday, the Holy Spirit whispered to me, and you don't mind if I share with you what the Holy Spirit is leading me to say, do you? You don't mind if I go off script and just let it flow with what the Holy Spirit is saying. You don't mind if I change everything up to be spirit-led, do you? Well, here's what the Spirit said to me. The Spirit said that, uh, uh, told me to tell you I believe, but it includes me because I'm preaching to myself. That's why I'm going real long today, because I got a lot to preach to myself about. You guys just happen to be here. But the Holy Spirit whispered to me and said uh, that, that for many of us in this season of life, you are going to have to fight for your peace. Now, I'm not saying you need to go out and eliminate everything. I'm not saying that you need to do anything in the flesh. I'm not saying that you need to organize a pro-peace march that goes across the country. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is that you're going to have to fight for your peace. What I'm saying is that according to the Bible, the weapons of this fight, 
the weapons of this warfare are not of the flesh, but the divine power of God to destroy strongholds. So what I'm encouraging you to do, if you need some peace in your life, that it will be a fight. And I'm encouraging you to fight for your peace with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I'm encouraging you to use the spiritual weapon of prayer to fight for the peace that God promises us that we can have. And in this season of your life, you might need to get a little defiant. I know you like to be cute. I know you like your Facebook pictures. I get that. I get that. I get that. But you might need to be a little defiant and pick up the word of God and says that and say that if God says I can have peace, then that means I can have peace. If God says I can have joy, then that means I can have joy. You might need to get a little ugly in the spirit, if you know what I mean. If God says that, uh, if the word says that Jesus came to bring life and life abundantly, then guess what? That's what the Bible says, and that's what God says I can have. And we don't serve a God who lies. I need you to engage in spiritual warfare as you have the belt of truth firmly fastened along your, around your waist. And if the Bible says that I can have the peace that passes understanding through prayer, then that means I can have the peace that passes understanding. Brothers and sisters, you might have to fight for your peace in this season of life. In fact, I believe it's time to fight for your peace and fight for your joy and fight for your hope. It's, it's time to fight with the weapons That God has given us the spiritual weapons that God has given us. It's time to not just watch the movie and say that was a good movie. Uh, No, it's time to uh, really get into your war room. To get alone with God. To get uh, in your prayer closet. In your war room. And put on some war paint. And say I'm not going to be disturbed this season of my life. I am going to have peace, family, if Jesus said, come to me. If Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, then you need to know that Jesus is not lying. He's not lying to you. He says, I will give you rest. He will give you rest. Jesus will give you rest. He will give you peace. Jesus is faithful to do everything that he said he would do in your life because Jesus is God's plan for peace. And he is our wonderful counselor. He is our everlasting father and our prince of peace. Would you fight not with the flesh, but with the spirit? I don't want to waste another day being aggravated and frustrated and and let that lead to anger. When God says, come to me, I'll give you peace. Would you fight for your peace this morning? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, uh, as, as, as much as it's a silent night, it's also a time for war. It's also a time for battle for you've told us that we can have the peace that passes understanding. You sent your son to give us peace, first with you and then with other people. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us meet the condition of being in your presence and and being men and women of prayer so that we can live a life of peace that passes all understanding, despite where we're living in a dark world. Father, would you flood our spirits with peace this morning, that, that even if we take it one week at a time, that, Father, you would help us come to you and that we would have peace. This week, as chaotic as the Christmas season is, flood us with peace, Father, so that we can then share the love of your Son with those around us. But let us be so different than the world. <laughs> Father, we thank you, we honor you, thank you for your grace and mercy. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.